Morning, everybody. Seven o'clock. How are you all feeling this morning? Heartbreak for Wales as England knocks them out of their first World Cup in 64 years. We'll bring you all the reaction live from Qatar as the Lions go through to the final 16. Also ahead, hopes of a breakthrough for Alzheimer's as a new drug is shown to slow memory decline for the first time. Plus, ambulance workers vote to go on strike as the wave of industrial action just keeps on growing. Speaking to the union and the boss of NHS providers about the impact on the health service. Lots to come. Busy show, Wednesday, the 30th of November. Ecstasy and agony as England knock Wales out of the World Cup. Hello from Qatar. It's the morning after the night before. England, victorious, are through to the next round. But Wales are going home. I'm live at a school in Monmouth speaking to young fans as Wales' World Cup dream comes to an end. Momentous and historic hopes after a new drug is found in trials to slow the progress of early stage Alzheimer's. Ambulance workers in England are set to strike before Christmas. Could it coincide with the planned nurses' walkouts? I'm on the high street as food prices rise at a record rate as inflation soars to 12.4%. NATO promises more arms for Kiev and equipment to help Ukraine restore power and heat knocked out by Russian airstrikes. Morning England is through to the final 16 of the World Cup in Qatar after beating Wales 3-0 second half last night and ending the Dragons' World Cup dreams. While the Welsh team heads home from their first World Cup in 64 years, the Lions are now preparing to face Senegal on Sunday. Population 11 million. Here's the moment England fans saw their team score last night. <laughs> That was one fan celebration in Box Park Wembley. We also caught reaction from both Wales and England supporters outside the stadium in Doha. What can you say? Absolutely terrible. No drive, no passion. What can you say? They have to rebuild with uh, some, some, uh, some of the younger players and uh, start again for the Euros. Hope springs eternal, mate. It was kind of a bit easy, really, if I'm honest. Sorry, Wales fans. <laughs> Ooh, she might live to regret that. Our Middle East correspondent, Alistair Bunkle, joining us now from Doha. Hi, Alistair. Good morning to you. Football coming home, certainly, as far as Wales is concerned. Yeah, we're outside the Wales team hotel this morning. They will be going home, we think, at some point later today. Uh, knocked out of the World Cup, bottom of the group, only managed to score one point. And, frankly, they were very much second best against England last night. It was, in a way, as the adage goes, a game of two halves. England were dominant in the first half, controlling possession and wearing Wales down. But in the second half, that's when they made the advantage count and scored those three goals to go top of the group and through to the next round. Whereas you say they'll face uh, Senegal, no easy task, uh, but topping the group has put England in a good position to progress through in this tournament. They're not training today. I think it's going to be a day off for them to try and rest their legs. They've got four days off, um, or at least four days before their next match uh, against Senegal on Sunday. So they'll be using every bit of those four days uh, to try and recharge the batteries and make sure they're fresh for Sunday's match. OK, just looking at the images, actually, as we're chatting. I mean, uh, you could hear a pin drop uh, around most of the country last night. I was trying to rush home to get to, the, to watch the anthems, just miss them, but there was literally nobody on the streets here in London. I can't even begin to imagine what it'd be like if they progressed further than the uh, last 16. Who is... Tell me about Senegal. What do we know about them? Well, Senegal are quite a good side. I mean, they have progressed before in the World Cup, before the West African side, passionate, passionate footballing nation. And so I don't think, and I, I know that when we speak to Gareth Southgate later in the week, you know, you, he'll tell you what you'd expect him to tell you, that uh, this is not a team to be underestimated. The benefit, of course, of qualifying first in the group, as England have done, is mean that they do face the slightly lesser team in Senegal uh, rather than uh, the Netherlands, who qualified uh, at the top of that group. And so it'll be the United States who will face Netherlands, England will face uh, Senegal. And I think Senegal have got quite an attacking uh, 
uh, bent to them, so they will be. Uh, I, I, we'll see whether or not Southgate does what he did yesterday and tries to shore up the midfield with the likes of Jordan Henderson in there, which which worked so well last night. Um, and just before I let you go, um, Alistair, I thought about um, that young lad, Marcus Rashford. Um, some commentators rather clumsily saying he's now concentrating on his football. I mean, he does an awful lot of uh, good work for youngsters up in Manchester and indeed around the country as well when it comes to trying to support them with free school meals. But he certainly showed his class last night. Oh, yeah. I mean, two fantastic goals. I mean, that first free kick uh, rocketed into the far corner of the net. And the second goal uh, was also England's 100th goal in World Cups. Marcus Rashford is a hugely talented player, hugely talented forward. He has had uh, a couple of off-seasons, for whatever reason, uh, and people probably unfairly may be pointing to the fact that maybe he was distracted elsewhere, away from football. But whatever it is, that is not the case at the moment. He's back on form for his club, Manchester United, and he's very much back on form for England. He was started last night uh, for the first time. I think Gareth Southgate will find it very hard to leave him out of the starting eleven come Sunday. Yeah, he certainly repaid the gaffer, didn't he? Thanks very much indeed, uh, Alistair, in Doha. Let's bring in Becky, who's standing by, as we can see, in Wales, a school in Wales. Oh, goodness, they're not going to be very happy this morning, are they? No, welcome to Monmouth Prep School, where pupils were allowed to stay up uh, last night and watch the match. There are some tired children uh, coming into school this morning and uh, very disappointed, particularly amongst the Welsh fans. Uh, let's bring in two of them, still wearing their Wales flags with pride, I'm pleased to see, boys. We've got uh, nine-year-old twins here, uh, Dylan and Ellis. Um, what did you make of the match last night? Uh, I think it was a good match, uh... It was not too good for Wales in the first half, but they kept on going in the second half, which was good for them. Yeah, and I know one of you said to me you did confess that once they started to lose 3-0, you decided just to give up and go to bed. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Now, you two, you're, you're kind of Wales super fans because you were actually in Qatar, weren't you? The headmaster here allowed you to have some time off school to go over there with your family and you saw the game against uh, the USA. So that was when the Wales dream was still very much alive. Tell us about that. So, um, in the first half, USA scored and Wales wasn't playing that good. But in the second half, Wales got a penalty and then Gav Bez scored it. So we drew. So, so hopes were so high then, and obviously yeah. now the Wales team coming home. It's quite disappointing, isn't it? Yeah, it is, but it's, I'm just really glad that they made it into the World Cup this far. Yeah, and you two were lucky enough to go there and see it in person, weren't you? Well, thank you so much for getting up early to speak to us after your late night watching the game and all the disappointment. Um, in actual fact, although this school's in Monmouth, it is a boarding school, so actually uh, you'll see the England flag on the bunting here because there was a split of about 50-50 last night. So pretty good atmosphere. I'm told it was very friendly. Uh, Noah, you were among the England fans watching. Um, tell us what you made of the match. Oh, I think it was a good match. I mean, it took a while for England to kick off. They, they had to start. It was after that free kick Rashford got and he scored it. That's really, they really like, brought them up and they started playing well. They got two goals in like, around 20, in a 20 minute gap. Then they played well. They controlled the game. They didn't let any other goals in. Yeah. And obviously, after that England success last night, hopefully there won't be too much gloating for your, your Welsh friends coming into school feeling pretty disappointed this morning. No, I'll try not to. I'll avoid that. Try not to, yeah. And what about the game against Senegal? What are you hoping to see? Well, hopefully we do, do, we do good. Um, it's a Senegal, so they're not that much of a challenging team. So hopefully we should come out with a win and maybe a win in extra time. All right. Thank you so much for speaking to us. So, yeah, I think there's going to be some very tired children uh, at school today and obviously uh, among the Wales fans, uh, pretty disappointed children as well here. Yeah, don't break it to that young England fan, but Senegal are a good team, don't tell him. Um, thanks very much indeed for now, everyone. Thank you. They look like shepherds, don't they, next to the Christmas tree? Now, doctors have hailed a new era of medicine after a study showed for the first time that a drug can slow the early symptoms of Alzheimer's. They say the drug provides evidence dementia can be treated. The clinical trial results showed that lecanemab slowed the progression of disease. Uh, and we believe this provides hope to patients, caregivers and physicians, stimulates further research into Alzheimer's and neurodegenerative diseases.
and uh, provides evidence that, that it is possible to treat these devastating um, our science correspondent, Thomas Moore, is with us now. Hi, uh, Thomas. Good morning. So tell us about the science. Yeah, look, you can't overstate the significance of this moment, Kay. For 30 years, scientists have been looking at this rogue protein called amyloid that builds up in the brains of people with Alzheimer's disease. And for those 30 years, they've really struggled to find a drug that does anything to that protein. But now they have one that really works. In this trial... The, the amount of protein reduced so much uh, that uh, the patients wouldn't have actually had a formal diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease after 18 months of treatment. And that had an impact on their clinical symptoms too. It reduced the mental, uh, the, the progression, the decline in mental agility and memory that you uh, associated with, with Alzheimer's uh, by 27%. And that is hugely significant. The first time that they've been able to show that. And doctors are optimistic that with longer treatment, that clinical benefit will become more significant. It's not a cure, but this does slow the progression of Alzheimer's for the first time and allows patients to spend more time with their families, of course. And when will it be available on the NHS, or is that too early to say? Well, it, it, this is really important because this is going to be a massive challenge for the NHS. At the moment, most patients are diagnosed too late to have this drug. Uh, and also uh, the, the number of uh, brain scans called PET scans uh, and also lumpunc lumbar punctures. These are biopsies of the spinal fluid that are needed to accurately diagnose Alzheimer's disease are only given to just 1% of patients. So this is going to need a revolution in the NHS to actually deliver. But we've been here with multiple sclerosis in the past with the treatments that are now available for that disease. And doctors are optimistic that with some forward planning, they can do the same here. It is an expensive drug, this lecanemab, but it's worth it in the long run, they say, because it would save on expensive social care. OK, and when might it be available? I mean, obviously, people listening this morning will think they're straight on the phone to the GP saying, I want that drug. Yeah. Look, it's a really important question, Kay, and this is a phase three trial. Now, the, the drug company thinks that it's going to apply for a drug license in the US early next year and then follow up with licenses here in the UK and in Europe. That could happen next year, too. It takes a while for them to look at the pros and cons of treatment. And this drug did have side effects. It's important to stress that. Uh, there, there was a potential for brain bleeds. So they need to make sure that they've got good monitoring in place to make sure patients can benefit from this. But hopefully it would be here used in two or three years. But again, I have to stress, this is just for mild cases, early stage Alzheimer's disease. And the NHS needs to really ramp up to make sure that patients do have good access to this drug. And finally, and just to develop your point there, um, Thomas, it, it, we, we must say that people have died during these trials, haven't they? Yes, the, you know, the, the side effects are, are, are really something that they are concerned about. And they think it's because these clumps of protein, of the rogue protein, when they're removed from the brain, it does really, uh, result in brain swelling and potentially bla brain bleeding. So it does need careful monitoring. But in terms of deaths, it was about the same number of people who died in the treatment group as those who were given the dummy drug. So uh, they have to be looked at very, very carefully to make sure that uh, this can be caught at an early stage. But one doctor said uh, last night, if, his, if he offered this drug to most patients, they would be happy to take this drug because uh, the, 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 the benefits are so great compared to the risk. This is such a devastating fear disease of old age that most people would take this drug and run that risk. I know you're going to develop this story throughout the course of the day, Thomas, so we will let you go. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, meantime, let's tell you about more winter strikes. Ambulance workers across England are likely to join nurses in going on strike before Christmas after voting in favour of industrial action. So what's the plan? Shingy has more for us uh, from, I think, Great Ormond Street uh, Children's Hospital, uh, which is one of the hospitals that could well be impacted. Shingy, good morning. 
Good morning, Kay. That's right. Great Ormond Street Hospital will be impacted by the other strikes, which we know are going ahead, the strikes called by the Royal College of Nursing. But on those ambulance strikes, as we understand, there isn't a date set for those yet, that they will involve call handlers, they'll involve technicians, as well as paramedics. But it's worth saying that strike action is far from unanimous, as far as we understand it. And only around 8 out of 200 trust was the threshold, the 50% threshold in the ballot met. And I think also there's lots of detail, a lack of some detail around exactly where in the country that would happen. But as far as we know, that will involve five ambulance trusts and two Merseyside hospital trusts. And that comes following the news of that nursing strike, which I mentioned, which will be the biggest industrial action by the Royal College of Nursing. We understand around 100,000 staff are taking strike action on the 15th and the 20th of December. With those go ahead, followed by these ambulance strikes or in, in some close proximity, that will pile the pressure on the NHS in what is already a really busy winter period. Indeed so. I mean, the concern is that, uh, as you were saying, these, these strikes could well all come along at the same time. What will that mean for the health service? It means serious pressure. We understand that there are serious backlogs in the NHS. And interestingly enough, the ambulance workers striking have pointed to those. They say that they don't just want wage increases, but that there's a backlog in the NHS and that they need to have wage increases so that they can attract more staff and thus cut the backlog in the NHS. If they go ahead, we're looking at really, really serious issues. We understand that cancer hospitals are on the list for the Royal College of Nursing strikes. We also understand that children's hospitals are on those. People could miss procedures procedures which they've been waiting a long time for and really serious and important procedures at that. OK, thanks very much indeed, Shingy. Thank you. And at nine o'clock tomorrow morning, going to be joined by union leaders, including Mick Lynch, the General Secretary of the RMT, and also um, Dave Ward from the Communication Workers Union, Postal Workers Union. They'll answer your questions in a special programme as the country faces a wave of strikes not seen in a generation. You can email your questions to asktheunionleaders at sky.uk or send them to me on uh, Twitter at Kay Burley. Lots of you have already done that uh, this morning. You can send them as a video if you would like to. We've done this uh, as a series, Ask Thee. And I think that, um, you know, if you've got a, a video or a thought that you would like to put in a video, then we can play that to the union leaders tomorrow morning. That's from nine o'clock in the morning. Ask the new union leaders tomorrow at nine. Um, you've got the email address there and you can tweet me at Kay Burley. Now, new figures show food prices are rising at their highest rate on record. Uh, Sky correspondent Adele Robinson is in Oxford for us this morning. This is not what people want to hear just before Christmas, is it, Adele? Good morning. Good morning, Kay. No, it's absolutely not. In fact, the survey this morning by the British Retail Consortium has been described as painting a picture that is increasingly bleak. It's certainly not spreading any Christmas cheer this morning here on Oxford High Street. And uh, what it has shown uh, is in the November... Um, prices in items across shops rose by 7.4% higher than they did in November of last year. And that is, as you say, a record high, uh, the highest that the British Retail Consortium have recorded since 2005, so in 17 years. Um, food, particularly, perhaps unsurprisingly, has risen um, by the most, particularly fresh food, so the likes of meat, eggs uh, and dairy. Coffee's also shot up uh, and also other things like uh, sports and recreational items. So overall, again, painting a picture that uh, Christmas gifting this year is going to be more expensive than in recent years. Um, with the food price inflation, though, um, what it's, what's driving it particularly, again, is uh, rising energy costs. And that's despite government intervention, government support for households. It may be that actually it's keeping a bit of a lid on inflation um, because we are expecting prices to come down in the new year. So we may be reaching the peak or, if not, already at the peak of inflation. Um, but we'll see what happens over the next couple of months. Um, why is this important? Well, not just because it's painful for people here on the high street um, buying food and other items, but also what happens with inflation informs what the Bank of England do with interest rates. Remember, they're trying to keep inflation down uh, by raising interest rates, and that in turn has a knock-on effect on mortgage rates. So I'm afraid, as I said, not much Christmas cheer here on the high street this morning. 
No, indeed not. I'm going to let, let you get out of the way of that backing up lorry. Thanks very much indeed, Adele. Thank you. There we go. Thank you. Just coming to get rid of the rubbish, aren't they now? Tensions between China and the West have risen in recent months over Taiwan, which Beijing claims as part of its territory. Joining us now from the Taiwanese capital, Taipei, is Tobias Elwood, Conservative MP and former uh, Defence Minister Chair of the Defence Select Committee as well, of course. Um, hello to you, Mr Elwood. Thanks for joining us. Why are you in Taiwan? Well, as you were just saying, uh, China's long wanted control of this island. It's important to understand what's going on here. Our minds have been focused on Ukraine, but President Xi has made it clear that it will use force if necessary uh, to take this island. And I think there are lessons to be learned from Ukraine. We didn't do enough there to prevent an invasion, and we're now feeling the economic and security consequences. Uh, China is now getting more aggressive, more assertive. And if President Xi fulfills his promise, the impact would be huge. It would not just be an ideolo ideological win over democracy, but China would gain a major economic powerhouse. This Here in this country, they make the advanced semiconductors that are used right across the world. Uh, it would also allow China to dominate the South China Sea, those important shipping lanes, and it would give China momentum to further pursue its author authoritarian agenda. And of course, how would the West look after that, uh, losing another democratic uh, partner? So it's so important to understand what is going on here and prepare for what might be coming over the, over the hill. OK, um, but as you know, Nancy Pelosi, the former Speaker of uh, US um, Congress, um, went in August. She saw, caused all sorts of uh, problems with tension between the Chinese and um, Taiwan. Um, how do you think that British politicians visiting will have any different impact? Well, it, it's important that you mention that. It, uh, China reacted uh, very angrily, wanting to shoo any politician from coming here to see what's going on. That interferes with their plans. But there are 23 million people here who have, I think, a, a very different view uh, about that. And it's important that we understand what is going on in this neck of the woods. I was really moved by what our prime minister said in his mansion a house uh, speech to recognize that uh, uh, we can't allow China uh, to be bullying its way in the same way that Russia has been doing uh, in Ukraine. Um, we heard the Prime Minister speaking about China and uh, relations with the UK during his Mansion House speech, of course, um, earlier on in the week, and Monday, I think it was. Um, and he was talking about China being a challenge. And when he spoke to me earlier in the year, he talked about them being a threat. Why do you think he's watered that down? Well, I mean, I really welcome this speech. It was the first solid foreign policy statement on China, I think, for many, many years. The so-called golden era of relations with China are now over. This idea that if we do simply more trade with China, they're going to open up to political reform, that clearly isn't going to happen. China, under President Xi, is pursuing a competing vision with the West uh, that I think could lead us, the world splintering to, to two, two spheres of influence. It's taking advantage of the timid West that's unwilling to date to call China out. So I'm pleased that uh, uh, Prime Minister Sunak has said this. Uh, China's expanding authoritarian influence is enormous right across the world. It needs this to fuel its own economy. So it's so important that we actually call this increasingly uh, uh, looking like a police state out and, and actually uh, stand up for our rights, our values, um, the international rule of law. Um, the Pentagon telling us that China's doubled its nuclear stockpile in the last two years, that they've conducted more ballistic missile tests last year than the rest of the world combined. How much is that sleeping dragon keeping an eye on what's happening in Ukraine? Well, the sleeping dragon, dragon is a great way to describe this. It's not just its nuclear arsenal that it's developing. Its army, its air force, its navy are now one of the largest in the world. They are colossal. And it's not just the South China Sea that they're dominating. They're starting to move their assets and put bases around uh, the world. As I say, this is actually competing with the Western way of life. And it's going to lead eventually to a clash. And we've been asleep of the last you know, two or three decades, if you like, in seeing uh, China advance, but not actually confirming what we believe is in allowing them to trade on their own terms, allowing them to advance in ways that really we should have uh, you know, called the check. And this is why the prime minister's statement, I think, is the first. But we do need to go further. And supporting Taiwan has uh, is, is got to be high on the agenda then. I uh, met up with 
the Ukrainian First Lady, Elena Zelensky, who is in London yesterday, and she told me um, that they want a special tribunal into Russian war crimes to be set up, and they want uh, the Brits to um, have the leading role in that. Do you think that is a good idea? How would it work? Yes, I think this is so important that any uh, soldier, whether you be a, uh, you know, a private, a sergeant, a colonel, or indeed a general who's operating under President Putin, recognises that whatever they do in Ukraine, it could come back to haunt them. And that could only happen if we collect the evidence, if we're able to put that material together and take it to the, to the, the ICC. So I think we should absolutely honour uh, the request uh, by the First Lady of Ukraine. Uh, it's something Britain has done in the past in places like uh, Rwanda and indeed Bosnia, and it absolutely needs to happen here again. This isn't just about defeating uh, Russia on the battlefield. It's making sure that any individual soldiers that uh, perform these absolute horrendous atrocities are held to account. And how does that actually work? You say we've done it before with Rwanda and Bosnia. What happens? Well, you collect the evidence on the day. You make sure that you're able to, to collate those. It then also requires going to the battlefields uh, and afterwards and, and making sure that you're able to uh, ascertain what happened there, particularly uh, in the uh, uh, where, where either um, weapon systems have been used or there are burial places and so forth, uh, taking testimonies and then being able to put cases forward uh, as to who was responsible. In some ways, this is a lot easier now because uh, people are taking footage with their own mobile phones and so forth, but being able to make the case of identifying which uh, Russian leaders, which Russian battle groups and formations were in what locations at what time. And why would it be uh, more important to potentially have um, the UK in, uh, involved in the lead in that as opposed to, to other neighbouring countries or indeed uh, other NATO allies? Well, we have experiences this, as I said. We are also a trusted and fair nation. Our judicial process is, is, is well respected. Uh, but ultimately, we have experience, and I think this is something we can do. We've invested more into Ukraine, arguably, than any other European nation in their hour of need. And I think this is another example of where Britain can, can lead from the front again. OK. Uh, thank you very much indeed for joining us, Mr Elwood. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this is what the First Lady uh, told us yesterday. Сьогодні я буду звертатися до парламенту, щоб Велика Британія стала лідером у створенні міжнародного трибуналу. Тому що дійсно просто закінчити війну – це перший етап. Другий етап – це знайти і покарати тих, хто давав злочинні накази. І це дійсно справа справедливості. Дебра Джоні є зараз лайв з Києва сьогодні. Перша леді, я роблю те, що, я впевнена, її хлопець би хотів робити, але він, в цьому часі, говорить про націю вночі. He is, and his address last night really underlined the fact that, well, yes, it's winter here, it's freezing cold, there is no pause in the fighting. Uh, the Russian troops, they've had these significant setbacks over the last few months in the east and also in the south, and yet the president was saying that they are attacking Ukrainian forces um, in Kharkiv, which is that region that the Ukrainians recaptured huge swathes of territory from back in September, also in the Donbass. And he said um, cryptically that he thought that they were preparing uh, for something in the south as well. The south is obviously where we've seen in the last few weeks that significant victory by Ukrainian forces pushing the Russians out of Kherson city, the only regional capital that fell to the Russians since their full-scale invasion in February. So this is a country still very much under attack, still very much in need of support from the West. And you've got NATO foreign ministers meeting at the moment in Romania. And the Ukrainian foreign secretary or foreign minister is also there, obviously not a member of NATO, but very much reliant on these allies and saying that the Ukrainians need 
Patriot uh, air defence systems, more powerful systems from the West that have yet to be granted, and also transformers. And that is a reflection of how Russia has been hitting, as well as the front line, this new energy front line, hitting power stations across Ukraine, trying to turn off the power. And the Ukrainians really need transformers to help them as they reconnect the grid and try to keep the power on. OK, for now, thank you. And if you scan the QR code on your screen, you can listen to the latest edition of the Sky News Daily Podcast with Neil today, speaking to our security and defence editor, Deborah, just there, about how the continued Russian shelling is affecting Ukraine's power grid. Still to come on the programme as postal workers begin a fresh two-day strike, talking to the boss of the Royal Mail, Simon Thompson. How's he going to fix it? Paramedics are set to join nurses in walkouts after voting to strike. Speaking to the interim chief exec of NHS providers, that's Saffron Cordry. And Labour's shadow immigration minister Stephen Kinnock is with me soon after 8 o'clock. Before that, some of today's other headlines for you. And a fresh wave of strikes is being staged today as Royal Mail workers, lecturers and also college staff stage walkouts around the country over pay, jobs and conditions. Picket lines will be mounted outside universities, sixth forms and Royal Mail centres as more action is planned in the run-up to Christmas. The founder of the right-wing Oath Keepers Militia has been found guilty of seditious conspiracy for his involvement in the 6th of January attack on the US Capitol last year. Stuart Rhodes instigated a plot to forcefully block Congress from certifying the victory of Democrat Joe Biden over Donald Trump in a 2020 presidential election. Half of all free-range turkeys produced for Christmas in the UK have been culled or have died due to bird flu. The British Poultry Council told MPs that 600,000 out of about 1.3 million birds have been lost. The government recently ordered all poultry and captive birds in England to be kept indoors due to the worst avian flu outbreak on record. Now, the boss of British Gas owner, Centrica, has told Sky News that more retail energy suppliers will probably go bust this winter. This winter, uh, Chris O'Shea also warned that the UK remains more vulnerable to energy shortages than its European neighbours. He's been speaking to our business correspondent, Paul Kelson. The first test of Britain's energy resilience has come as expected from the weather. But at the Easington gas terminal on Humberside, it's not the cold that has led to gas being brought onshore and out of storage for the first time this winter. This is the rough gas pipeline. It runs from here 18 miles out to sea to the storage facility, but now for the first time since it reopened, it's bringing gas in in the other direction. It's because of the weather. It's overcast, it's still and it's cold. There's very little solar or wind power being generated, so the National Grid has called for gas to come in through this pipe and it's on its way to fire power stations and homes and businesses. Centrica reopened the rough storage field in September as the government scrambled to shore up supplies. The chief executive says it will help keep the lights on. So if that wasn't there today, we'd have to look for alternative sources of gas or we'd have to look for ways to cut electricity consumption, but definitely the price would have gone up. Simple economic supply and demand. If demand goes up and supply doesn't go up, then prices increase. So this is keeping prices down. Just under two bar to go, so we're not far off. Even with the rough storage facility open, the UK has only nine days' supply of gas in reserve, a fraction of our European neighbours. Europe has significantly higher gas stores than we do. Um, Germany, France and Italy, they've all got a significant mobility to keep gas in uh, um, uh, below sea or um, subterranean um, reservoirs. Centrica is the UK's largest domestic supplier as well as an oil and gas producer. And the boss is warning its competitors may not make it through the winter. There are a number of energy suppliers that are in a precarious financial position. And, and that's just getting worse every day. Every day that they make more losses, they get in a worse position. The risk of failure increases. And, and I, I really worry that we're going to see more failures. By and large, they're owned by wealthy individuals who have a free bet. If this goes right, they will make even more money than they have today. And if it goes wrong, our customers have to pick up the cost. That cannot be right. Easington can handle 20% of the UK's gas needs. Next door, a Norwegian pipeline supplying another 30% makes landfall. The UK 
needs every molecule this winter. Paul Kelso, Sky News on Humberside. Let's return to one of our top stories. We now the chair of the Commons Defence Select Committee has backed a call from Ukraine's First Lady for the UK to lead the way in the creation of a special international tribunal to prosecute Russia for aggression against her nation. Here's what Tobias Elwood told us just a little earlier. This is so important that any uh, soldier, whether you be a, uh, you know, a private, a sergeant, a colonel, or indeed a general who's operating under President Putin, recognises that whatever they do in Ukraine, it could come back to haunt them. And that could only happen if we collect the evidence, if we're able to put that material together and take it to the, to the, the ICC. So I think we should absolutely honour uh, the request uh, by the First Lady of Ukraine. Uh, it's something Britain has done in the past in places like uh, Rwanda and indeed Bosnia, and it absolutely needs to happen here again. This isn't just about defeating uh, Russia on the battlefield. It's making sure that any individual soldiers that perform these absolute horrendous atrocities are held to account. Tamara is with us to talk about so all matters politic this morning. Hi, um, Tamara. So the First Lady, we've seen a lot of her while she's been here of Ukraine, and she wants Britain to go further in their help. That's right. She gave this incredibly powerful address to parliamentarians yesterday afternoon, talking about some of the horrors uh, that she had seen and encountered during the conflict, including uh, sexual violence as a weapon of war, some really harrowing uh, stories that she touched on there. And she said that she wanted Britain to take the lead in setting up a special prosecutor because she said it's of course hugely important that human rights abuses in this conflict are documented and people eventually brought to justice and um, the criticism of the International Criminal Court in The Hague is that only I think two rape cases over the past 20 years have been prosecuted and um, the demand from uh, the Ukrainian government is that a special prosecutor is set up just for this, as it was for uh, the conflict in Rwanda and then in Bosnia, just to take evidence uh, on this subject. Uh, we know Dominic Raab has already um, looked at um, trying to help um, with get ev evidence gathering as the Justice Secretary um, for um, potential uh, legal action in the future, but she wants Britain to take the lead on that and will be uh, pressing the government as to what they're going to do to help them. But the, the government response so far has been supportive. OK, Tamara for now, thanks so much indeed. Tomorrow's take, of course, at nine o'clock. Looking forward to that, thank you. Uh, now, a fresh wave of strikes is beginning as the year of industrial action continues across the country. Royal Mail workers, university lecturers, sixth form staff are taking part in walkouts today. Joined now by Simon Thompson, Chief Exec at the Royal Mail. Um, hello to you, Mr Thompson. Thank you for joining us on the programme this morning. When are you going to get these posties back to work? Well, the first thing I would say is I just want to offer a huge apology to our customers, both our retail customers that trust us to deliver things to the door and also our customers that receive things at the door. And the other thing I would just like to make really, really clear is that we are doing absolutely everything we can to make sure that we protect Christmas whilst the CW leadership are doing everything they can to destroy Christmas. In terms of our posties, we've offered them a 9% uh, pay increase. That's a cost of £400 million for us as a business. And that's £400 million when we're losing £1.2 million a day. We really do feel that that is fair. And the other thing as well I would add is that we've been accused by the CWU of wanting to be a gig economy uh, business. And this, again, is totally not true. You know, we have 97% permanent employment. We pay 18 to 14% more than the industry norm. And I even offered them the opportunity of having a campaign together on improving the standards in the industry. And they turned me down on that. I also offered them the opportunity of a profit share scheme. And they also turned me down on that. And on my way in this morning, I was listening to the radio and I heard one of our customers, Biscuiteers, who were very, very clear in their asks, which is they want us to give a seven-day delivery service for parcels. They want us to be able to deliver those parcels overnight. And they were also very, very clear that this disruption up to Christmas is really not good for their customers and is not good for their business. Um, you listed some of the things that the union has been accusing you of. Trust me when I tell you that the leader of the union was on the programme last week, accusing you more of that than that, saying that um, his members uh, were being um, intimidated by um, the Royal Mail in order to do things they didn't want to do? 
Do you know, I'm actually pleased that you raised that point because on strike action days, we've seen some extraordinary behaviours. We've had allegations of racism. We've had allegations of sexism. We've had people threatened with violence. We've had people actually suffering actual violence. It's an extraordinary situation, and it's not something that we will ever tolerate. We have some cases that are currently going through our processes, and we will be taking action as is required. OK, so you've been accused of sexism and racism. Um, what would you say? Are you? No, as I said, that we have had some allegations and we take these things very, very seriously. And we make sure that if there's anybody that is not behaving correctly, regardless of who they are in the organisation, I would add, that they are dealt with in the most swift and best way possible. OK, thank you for clarifying that. Also, um, Mr Ward, uh, the union leader, went on to say... He challenged you, actually, on my programme last week to say, come and sit down and meet with him at any stage to try to get this resolved. We have been talking for seven months to try and get this situation resolved around change. And for the first six months, the union did not engage in those discussions at all. I then offered them the opportunity of joining me with ACAS, and I have to say that did eventually happen. And a big thank you to the team of ACAS. I thought they were professional and dedicated to try and help us resolve this situation. It took the CWU nearly a month to take me up on that offer. We then spent three weeks in intensive talks, including weekends, which I also participated in. And at the end of that, they rejected our change agenda completely out of hand. Um, Mr Ward said that he would come on this programme at any time to debate with you. Will you come on and debate with him on the programme? I think that what we need to be spending our time on... Mm, that's a yes or no answer, Mr Thompson. He's prepared to come on the programme. You say you want to get this sorted out. Can you come on the programme and discuss it with him? I think what we need to be dedicating our time on here is executing the agenda for change that we need so we can compete and win in the market. We've given our final offer. It is not something that is negotiable, but I'm more than happy to meet Mr Ward to discuss our final offer. I think that what the CWU are doing is they are distracting away from the actual core of the issue here. The core of the issue here is that we used to be a letters business. We are now a parcels business. We spent 900 million pounds on investment so we can compete and win in the market. And as for the business plan, here is the business plan that the CWU actually offered me on one piece of paper. It is not costed. It has no timelines. I question whether this is actually at all credible. OK, well, Mr Ward's coming on the programme tomorrow. Um, you are very welcome to come on and join him. Um, if not, then, you know, you're giving him a free reign. That's up to you. Let me ask you briefly before I let you go. Why can't posties um, have the England flag on their vans? Well, what I would say is that we support everyone and every team and we're making sure that our team... Uh, can have time to watch the games as they wish. And that's for absolutely every team. I think in terms of flags on vans, I'm afraid it's a safety issue and a safety question. Um, so therefore, we have to make sure we keep people safe. But we definitely wish every team well. And any of our posties that would like to watch those games, we hope that they definitely enjoy them. OK, it's good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Much appreciated. Maybe I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, ambulance workers are also set to striking England uh, before Christmas with Unison, the uh, latest union to ballot for industrial action. Joined now by the interim chief exec of NHS providers, that's Saffron Cordry. Um, hello to you. Thank you for joining us on the programme. Um, how will my viewers be affected by strikes by ambulance workers? Well, we know it's an incredibly pressured time across the NHS at the moment in any case. And I think what we are looking at now is, is a ramping up of that pressure. But what we do know and what trust leaders who are members of my organisation are focusing on is how we minimise the impact on patients and those seeking the support of the ambulance service. And there are tried and tested plans in place to deal with situations where staff aren't available. So, so those um, challenges to patients will be minimised as far as possible, but it's fair to say that this is going to be a difficult period ahead. What tried and tested plans are you talking about there? So we're talking about the kind of um, 
emergency preparedness plans that have been tested over the last few weeks with the Operation Arctic Willow, which um, is an exercise that looks at combining both um, winter pressures with the um, pressures of strike action from nurses and ambulance services. So there's, you know, making sure that trusts are as prepared as possible, but also the kind of um, exercises and plans that are put in place to respond to any emergency where it looks like um, ambulances and other parts of the health service will not be available. So um, these these kind of contingency plans are, are put in place on an ongoing basis. So Operation Arctic Willow, does that involve the army? Um, what we know is that the um, army stands ready to help um, if it is needed. I think it's clear that, as we saw during COVID, it's really helpful when, when the armed forces can step in. I think that the role they played during COVID was very much um, supporting, supporting other services with things like vaccinations. And I think the reality is that, that if the army or other armed forces step in, it, it's going to be very much at the margins rather than um, going out and, and driving ambulances. Um, so there will be a role if they are needed, but that isn't going to be the central plan. Do we know when this industrial action might be? Because feasibly, of course, two weeks notice for a strike, we could see that the ambulance uh, workers and nurses are on strike at the same time. What sort of problems will that cause? Well, we don't yet know when, when these strikes will be. Obviously, um, oh, but it's possible, the... isn't it? It's it's a possibility, and you know that would be very challenging for the NHS, as we know. Um, but we don't yet know when this strike action will take place. So I think it, it's fair to say that the NHS plans for all eventualities, of course, um, but we we don't know when that strike action is going to happen because the announced the the results of the ballot have only just been announced last night. Yeah, but they need two weeks so they could buy if they announce yeah, it by. Feasibly. Thursday, then feasibly tomorrow, they feasibly could do that. Why do you think that a 4% pay rise is enough? Sorry, I couldn't hear your question. I'm so sorry. I was asking about a 4% pay rise. Why is that enough? Um, we're not, as NHS providers, we're not an organisation that, that sets whether uh, the pay rise is enough or it isn't. That's for the government to negotiate. Our trust leaders aren't in a position to negotiate that pay rise or any pay rise or terms and conditions with, with NHS staff. That's very much a government issue. What our trust leaders are focusing on is how they manage the impact of this strike and, and support their staff as well. Do you think it's enough? I think it's it, that is very much a situation for the government. I've, what I would say is that we know that NHS staff, whether they're nurses, whether they're ambulance staff, paramedics, and and indeed doctors, have are are feeling the impact of inflation, the cost of living, and the very real challenges that that many workers across the country are facing at the moment. And they have been through a very significant period of intensive working during the pandemic. So we understand why they are, are seeking a pay award, but that's very much for, for the government to, to focus on. And what we have to remember is that there are some really core underlying issues here around workforce shortages that need to be addressed by the government. So we need to see a proper long-term plan for the workforce that's got the money behind it to put that into place. Because right now, we've got vacancies of around 130,000 uh, across the NHS, and that isn't sustainable to run a service. OK, good to see you this morning. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, just a reminder, nine o'clock tomorrow, joined by union leaders, including Mick Lynch, the General Secretary for the RMT, and Dave Ward from the Communication Workers Union, who are on strike. Uh, we just were speaking actually to the head of the Royal Mail. Um, will he come in and join them? Unlikely, but certainly Dave Ward said that he would be happy to debate with him at any stage. Uh, the prime reason for the guys coming in is that they're going to be answering your questions in a special programme as the country faces a wave of strikes not seen 
in a generation. You can email your questions to ask the union leaders at sky.uk or send them to me on Twitter at Kay Burley. Lots of you doing that already. And you can also send them as a video question if you would prefer. Ask the union leaders tomorrow at 9am. Do you have a brickbat or perhaps a bouquet for them? Uh, in question form, let me know. Now, it was a night of celebration for England, but heartbreak for Wales as the Lions knocked the Dragons out of the World Cup, beating them 3-0 in the second half. Let's talk about it, shall we? In more detail, Josie Green, who plays for the Wales women's team and Leicester City, is with us now. It's good to see you. Did you have any divided Hello. loyalty, given that you play for an England, England club, but you're obviously um, Welsh? No, not at all. I've played for the Welsh national team since I was 14, and... Um, it really holds a special place in my heart and, you know, I'm Welsh through and through. I play for the national team and I was really gutted to see the result go the way that it did. Um, how do you think they'll be feeling this morning? As a player, I really think they'll be gutted. Um, it's such a shame the World Cup has gone as it has. I think that things didn't click on the pitch for them the whole World Cup and I think the players themselves um, know that. Joe Allen said that in his interview that you know, things weren't working for them and the game against England was going to be the biggest game of his career. And I think that it's a it's a real shame that the result went the way that it did. Um, the first half, I mean, they, they I'm not sure if it was because they were playing well or England weren't playing as well. Um, it was certainly, as they say in football parlance, a game of two halves. Yes, absolutely. And Rob Page went into the game um, with a different system and you could see that clearly. Wales went with a back four and it really kept England at bay for the first half. Um, and it's just a shame that, you know, it was a tale of two halves in the second half. It, for whatever reason, it didn't work for them and, and England came out on top. How well do you think England played? I think the changes that Gareth Southgate made and, you know, the likes of Phil Foden and Marcus Rashford both getting goals, I think. You can see the depth in their squad and I think that's going to be key for them moving forward. And I think the first half, I don't think they played well, but you could see the, the moments of quality that they did have in the second half and that made all the difference. It sure did. How do you think they'll do against Senegal? It will be a really tough match. Um, you can see in this World Cup that any team can beat anyone and... You have to be good on your day and the consistency in England, I'm not sure that we've seen it as much as maybe other clubs in the world, other teams in the World Cup. Um, I think it'll be a tough game. If I was going to predict, I might go it going to extra time and I think they're going to make it in the um, extra time. But yeah, tough game for them. Um, Brazil, I think, and France are still favourites to lift the trophy. What's your prediction? I think, in my opinion, Brazil um, have got a great squad. They've got great squad depth. Um, you know, you've got the likes of Neymar hopefully coming back from injury as well. And they've looked really impressive so far. Um, as well with France, I think they also look really good in the tournament. But do they have the hunger and desire having, you know, won a recent World Cup? Um, I think that's my only question that I have to ask to them. OK, well, it's um, great to talk to you. Thanks for joining us on the programme this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Um, of course, it's the weekend, isn't it? Am I right in saying it is Sunday when we play Senegal? I think I'm right in saying that. I'm sure if I'm not, somebody will correct me. Lucy, in my ear, telling me that I am. Ha! Uh, let's have a look at uh, what's happening with Mariah Carey. Maya, Mariah Carey, a new study suggests that bats <laughs> are extreme when it comes to sound production and have a greater vocal range than singers like Mariah Carey. Researcher, <laughs> I can't believe I'm reading this. Researchers from the University of Southern Denmark filmed what goes on in a bat's voice box for the first time ever and found that the normal vocal range for a bat spans seven octaves. Speaking of how many octaves you can span, we've got... Jersey Boys, Frankie Valley, the number of octaves that he could span, talking about that uh, in the nine o'clock hour. We're all very excited about that. Time now, though, for a look at some of the photos that have caught our eye 
today. Here we go, big day for Britain's Grand Slam champ, Emma Raducanu. Uh, she was at Windsor collecting her MBE from the King for services to tennis. The Mail have worked out how much her Dior outfit cost. Any guesses how much that Dior outfit might have cost? She is a millionaire tennis player, of course. £9,400. Wow, indeed, Matt. That belt alone is worth nearly £1,500 for a belt. Can you imagine? No expense spared when meeting His Majesty, obviously. I mean, picking a belt up and it's got a price tag of 1500 quid and go, oh, yeah, all right, I'll have that. Uh, look at this uh, almost apocalyptic glow on the horizon in Hawaii. Lava flows now over two and a half miles long as the world's largest active volcano continues its first eruption in nearly 40 years. Officials warning people should stay away even if there's no immediate threat to communities. And if you need a cool down after that blistering heat, how about a quick trip to the lovely market town of Stirling? That's a great photograph, isn't it? Um, Beautiful winter morning, if you can recognise this landmark tower peeking out from under the fog. It's the Wallace Tower, commemorating the 13th century Scottish hero. Depicted by... who depicted, wasn't he? I can't remember his name. The um, Somebody tell me. Help me out with the Hollywood hero who uh, was uh, Wallace. Nope, nope, nope. Lucy has nothing for me this time. Now, with a fresh wave on industrial action being staged, coming up in just a few moments' time, I'm going to be speaking to Labour's Shadow Home Office Minister, and that is Stephen Kinnock. Uh, there are so many strikes that we need to tell you about. The posties are on strike um, again. We've just been speaking to the head of Royal Mail. He said, we are no longer a letter service. What we are is um, a post office as that deals with um, parcels. And that's what the posties have to reckon with. They say, come round the table and talk to us. We've invited them both on the programme tomorrow. Let's see what happens as far as that concerned. Don't forget, Ask the Union Leaders is at nine o'clock. Tomorrow, we have got the leader of the RMT and other leaders on the programme. Have you got a question? at Kay Burley. Let me know. We'll put it to them. See you in a second. Do hopes. So.